Another important method by which we can purify proteins is gel electrophoresis. And just like in gel filtration chromatography, in gel electrophoresis we also separate our proteins based on size. But there's an important difference between gel electrophoresis and gel filtration chromatography as we'll discuss towards the end of this lecture. So what exactly do we mean by electrophoresis? Well, electrophoresis simply means that we use an electric field to basically move and separate our proteins based on size. And we'll see exactly how that works in just a moment. So let's begin by discussing the experimental setup, the apparatus that we use for gel electrophoresis. So this is basically what we have. So we have this structure and inside the structure we have this porous gel and we'll see exactly what that gel consists of in just a moment. So inside the structure we have the gel and we connect the entire apparatus to some type of power source to some type of voltage source, for example a battery. And we connect it in such a way so that the top portion becomes negatively charged and the bottom portion becomes positively charged. Now these holes on the top are called wells and we basically place our mixture into these wells. For example, we can take one mixture of proteins, place them into well number one and then we wait some time and we'll see a separation of proteins actually take place as we'll see in just a moment. So proteins always move from the negatively charged end to the positively charged end from the top to the bottom and we'll see why that's the case in just a moment. Now, if we zoom in onto the microscopic level, onto the gel, this is basically what we're going to get. So we have this gel polymer, so the gel consists of this polymer that basically intertwines and forms these pores and channels that allow the molecule, the protein in this case, to actually move along our gel. So this, for example, this green structure is our protein. Now, let's begin by using a bit of physics. So, what we want to do in the next several steps is to basically come up with some mathematical equation that describes the velocity of the movement of that particle, the protein, along our gel. So, let's begin with the forces. So, the question is, what are all the forces that are acting on the protein, this green structure, as it moves down along our gel? Well, we have two forces. We actually have three forces. We also have the force of gravity, but because the force of gravity is so, is, is so much smaller than the other forces, we can neglect the force of gravity. We can assume it's equal to zero. So there are two forces. It's the electric force that exists as a result of that electric field that pulls on that protein and makes it move down along our gel. So remember from physics, anytime we have a separation of two opposite charges, we're going to have an electric field. And so in this case, we have an electric field because this entire structure is connected to our battery. So we have this electric force, we're going to mark down with Fe. Now it points downward because it points in the direction of motion. In fact, it causes that motion in the first place. Now the other force is the frictional force. It's the drag force that exists as a result of this polymer that is in the way of this protein. So the protein basically moves along the polymer and then that polymer, the gel, exerts a force that basically pushes opposite to the direction of motion. So this is the force of friction, the drag force, and they point in opposite directions. So to, uh, to come up with an equation, we have to begin with the second law of motion. So Newton's second law of motion tells us that the net sum, the sum of all the forces acting on that object along our direction of motion is equal to the product of the mass of the object multiplied by its acceleration. Now we're going to assume that the velocity of that particle as it travels down is constant and that will make, th and that will make things easier because if our velocity is assumed to be constant that means our acceleration is zero. So the A on the right side is zero in this entire higher term goes to zero. Now what about the left side of our equation? What is our net force? 
Well, the net force or the sum of the forces is simply the sum of these two forces. And remember, force is a vector, that means it, it, it has magnitude as well as direction. So this is a positive force because it points in the same direction as motion, but this force is negative because it opposes motion. So we have a positive electric force plus a negative frictional force, and that is equal to zero. Now, the question is, what exactly is the electric force and what is our frictional force? Well, from electromagnetism, we know that if we have a charge that is inside a constant electric field, then the force our charge feels is simply that electric field E multiplied by the quantity of charge on that molecule. So Q is the charge and E is our constant electric field. Now the field here is constant because the voltage source of the battery, the battery has a constant voltage. Now what about the frictional force? Well, we know that the drag force is equal to the coefficient of friction F multiplied by V, the velocity of that object. And this V is exactly what we want to solve for. So we can rearrange our equation and solve for V and we find that V is equal to the product of the electric field and the charge Q divided by the coefficient of friction F. So from this equation, we see that our velocity of that protein as it travels along the gel depends on three factors. On the magnitude, the strength of that electric field E, on the amount of charge on that protein Q, as well as on uh, the frictional coefficient that is due to that porous gel. Now, notice that if the Q is a negative charge, the velocity will be negative. And what that means is it travels down. If the charge is positive, then that means it will move upward. But we'll see in just a moment that the charge of the protein is always negative, and that's because we make it negative. So if we increase the electric field or if we increase the charge, our velocity increases, but if we increase the coefficient of friction F, then our velocity decreases. And we'll come back to this equation in just a moment. So now let's move on to our gel. What exactly is so special about the gel and what is the gel made of? Well, the gel is usually made of this material known as polyacrylamide. And polyacrylamide is essentially a polymer that intertwines and folds and makes these many pores and channels that allows the protein to actually move across. Now, polyacrylamide is very inactive, and what that means is it will not react chemically with the protein, and that's an important property because as the protein travels along the gel, we don't want that protein to actually react and change its chemical nature, and that's why polyacrylamide is used most often. It's easy to make, it creates these channels and pores, and is unreactive with the protein, doesn't chemically react. So, in the beginning, we said that gelatrophoresis separates our proteins based on their size. The next question is, how exactly is that accomplished? And what are the steps that we have to take before we actually place the protein mixture into our well? So basically, that sample of proteins that we want to separate is placed into a special denaturing solution. And that denaturing solution contains two important molecules. It contains beta mercaptoethanol, which is used to break the disulfide bonds connecting our tertiary structure. And we also have a molecule known as sodium dodecyl sulfate, or SDS. And what SDS does, and by the way, this is sodium dodecyl sulfate, it contains this carbon chain, at the end it contains this negatively charged sulfate ion, sulfate group, and it is connected to our sodium molecule. Now in solution, these two groups will actually separate. So basically what SDS does is it does two important things. Firstly, it breaks the non-covalent interactions of that protein, denaturing that protein. And what it also does is it actually attaches onto the main side chain groups of amino acids at a ratio of one attachment per two amino acids. So when the protein is denatured, 
SDS anion. So this entire section here minus the sodium atom, the SDS anions attach onto the side chains of amino acids at a rate of about one SDS anion per two residues, two amino acids on that particular protein. Now, when they actually attach onto the protein, because these SDS molecules contain a negative charge, they give that protein a negative charge. And ultimately, after we have these many, many anions attach onto our protein, the entire net charge of that protein becomes negative. So even if the protein before this process had a negative positive charge, native simply means when the protein is in its three-dimensional native structure, it contains a certain net charge, and so some proteins contain a net negative charge, some proteins naturally contain a net positive charge, and some are naturally neutral. So even, so regardless of what the charge was on the protein before, following this process, that protein gains a net negative charge. And that's important because, as we said earlier, we want the proteins to move from the top, from the negative side, to the bottom, to the positive side in our electric field. So this charge Q has to be a negative charge. So as the, uh, since SDS anions have a net negative charge, this means that by attaching onto the protein, the protein is made negatively charged. Now, as the SDS protein complexes move down the gel, they are dragged by the electric field. And since they all have negative charges, they all move in the same general direction from the top to the bottom along our gel. Now, one important point, another important point that I have to point out about this molecule is the following. So when these SDS anions attach onto the protein, they attach in a ratio of one per two amino acids. Now, if we have a very large protein with many amino acids, that means that large protein will contain many more of these SDS anion attachments. And what that means is if we compare a large protein to a small protein, both of those proteins will have a net negative charge, but the larger protein we ha will have a greater net negative charge. So let's go back to this equation for just a moment. So in this equation, we see that the velocity is directly proportional to the charge. So if the charge in is increased when everything else is kept constant, then the velocity will increase as well. So what this means is large proteins, because they contain more amino acids, they will contain more of these negatively charged sodium dodecyl sulfate groups. And so they should be able to move along our gel with a greater velocity than the smaller molecules. But we know that is not true. In fact, the opposite is true. Smaller molecules, smaller proteins move along the gel quicker with a greater velocity. Why is that? Well, if we go back to this equation, the electric field at any time is constant because the voltage is constant. So E does not change. So when we increase the size of our protein, we increase our Q. But we also increase not only the charge Q, we also increase the drag force and the coefficient of friction F as a result of that drag force. And in fact, we increase that coefficient F by a greater amount than we increase the Q. And so because F gets larger by a greater amount as compared to Q, this entire fraction becomes smaller when the protein size increases. And so the velocity does does in fact decrease for larger proteins because of that drag force that exists between that porous gel and that protein. So larger proteins move more slowly because they experience a greater friction than smaller proteins, even though those larger proteins contain a greater charge. 
even though they contain a greater charge, they feel a much greater frictional force that is proportionally greater than the increase in charge. And so the overall velocity, the rate of movement of larger proteins is lower than that of the smaller proteins. And that means larger proteins will be higher up along that slab than smaller proteins over that same time interval. So let's actually conduct our experiment with a mixture of three different proteins of unequal size. So we have, let's say, green proteins that are large, we have these orange proteins that are intermediate, and we have these purple proteins that are small. So we have a mixture of three proteins, and we add that into our denaturing solution that contains the beta mercaptoethanol and the sodium dodecyl sulfate SDS. So once we, make the, uh, once we mix that mixture, the proteins are denatured and these SDS anions attach onto the proteins and that makes all the proteins, all these three proteins, negatively charged. And now we take a pipette, we basically take a small portion of our mixture and we place it into a well. For example, let's say we place it into well number one, this insertion here. So once we place it, initially it will look like this. All those proteins at a time of zero will basically be together on the same level at the top. So we have these small purple ones, 